Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to our third High Vault web talk live here from Dresden. We had great feedback the last week. Thanks that you all join us. Thanks that you participate in this talk. Uwe, hello. It's nice to meet you. And we are in a specially new location here on a trailer. Are we going away? Now we will stay the whole session here. So we have changed location from our big hall to a smaller, uh, it's the so-called hall fear, uh, four, where <laughs> we do all the assemblies uh, of such kind of trailers. And by the way, this kind of trailer mm -hmm. is like the iPhone in the high voltage test world because okay. this system was sold more than 200 times. And uh, I think it's also important to get a kind of understanding uh, what's all about. This is uh, the iPhone, which is a very heavy iPhone in a way. But of course, we have a kind of an explanation video to see what this uh, test site can, can uh, do. Sure. So Peter has prepared this uh, excellent video. And uh, so not I will explain it. So Peter, our expert, will explain to us what we see here in the background. you see in the background, this is a complete uh, cable test system for on-site testing of cable systems. With such a trailer, you are able to test up to 6 kilometers uh, at 260 kV. For lower test voltages, you can test cables up to a length of 20 kilometers. Here you see the control and feeding unit of the system. Consists mainly of a frequency converter and all other parts are necessary to control the high voltage test. This heavy part is the exciter transformer. This is a normal transformer which adapts the output voltage from the frequency converter to the necessary input voltage of the high voltage circuit. Behind me, the most heaviest part of the test system, this is the resonant reactor with a weight of 22 tons. And this reactor forms together with the cable capacitance an oscillating circuit. To measure the generated test voltages, we use this capacitive divider. The divider is followed by this protection impedance, which is used to protect the reactor against backcoming uh, transients. And finally, at the end, we have a so-called coupling capacitor to measure PD, if necessary. And from here, from this point, we go to the test object. Yeah, thank you very much to Peter Kors for explaining us uh, the subject of today, on-site cable testing, new trends, of course. You can partic uh, participate on this web talk, as always, in our chat function. We have the YouTube chat function. We have the email, of course. It's webtalk at highvault.com. So we are inviting you to participate and to uh, um, talk with our experts. We have invited experts with quite together more than 100 years of experience, and I start with Klaus Vaterrod. Klaus Vaterrod, welcome, Head of Center of Competence, OSB Kema Labs. Um, he studied electrical engineering, focus on, of course, um, HV, HV or high voltage at the Technical University of Berlin. He's development engineer of power cables at uh, BICC. He was there at the cable factory and he's, of course, part of the German Standardization Committee of Power Cables and member of SIGRE. Welcome, Klaus Vaterrod. Thank you for the invitation. Peter Kors, we saw your video right now. He is a supervisor, a team engineer for hardware and software here in the house at High Vault. So it's his home turf. He studied at Dresden University of Technology. He's a specialist in frequency turned resonant test systems of field testing. So it's all about field testing today <laughs> and of cable systems. And he's a member of IEEE. Welcome to Peter Kors. Thank you very and much. We connect from Dresden, of course, to the world. We are connecting live to Singapore now. Um, and there is Ton Chuang, Mr. Fu. Hey, Mr. Fu, hello and welcome. Director of Aspectus Engineering Services. He's a registered professor engineer with Singapore Professional Engineers Board of more than 50 years and uh, actively involved in the on-site high voltage test on GIS and high volt cables. Welcome, Mr. Fu to Singapore. Can you hear us loud and clear? 
Yes, and good evening and hello, everyone. Excellent. The challenge, Mr. Fu, is to set up high power test systems in compact multi-story situations and substations. The challenge would be greater with more underground trans transmission. This is really a big challenge. Um, and this is, of course, getting more and more in the future due to more density in big cities like Singapore. What are the challenges of on-site testing, cable testing in mega cities like Singapore? Well, Singapore itself is a very small city state center, uh, city and it's about 700 square kilometers. We have a population of 5.8 million people. And within this small area, we need land space for reservoirs, nature, parks, power generation, our industries mm -hmm. and residentials. Land is a scarcity for us and hence we need to minimize the land use for transmission and distribution of power. We have 100% cable system, and we have been using direct buried high voltage and high, extra high voltage cables with multi-story substation that are designed to minimize the land use since the 1970s. Today, the optimization of land continues at another level with smaller size equipment, new underground substations, as well as cable tunnels right down to 60 meters in depth. Wow. When we receive an inquiry for high voltage test on a cable, we start with calculation to know and to understand how, how many types of test systems need to be put in parallel and what types of test system we need to put in place. In compact substation, the high voltage and extra high voltage cables are terminated usually onto a GIS, which is the gas insulated switch gears, or directly on transformer cable box. For short length cables, it is possible to bring a small test system of around 8 to 10 amps to the switch gear floor for the test. But however, for the long length of cables, you need a trailer based cable test system like what Peter has uh, introduced to you just earlier on. Now, first challenge is that the, the test bushing is usually mounted on the switch gear floor, which could be on the third or on the fifth floor. And we have to connect this flexible aluminum duct that act as a corona control shield. Mm -hmm. And internally, we have this internal rated current carry conductors to connect from the upper levels right down to where the test system can be deployed. Okay. Insulation support as well as insulated suspension ropes are also used to support the aluminum duct assembly. Mm -hmm. Now, the most important thing is safety because you have a very large test area and we need to have sufficient clearance for safety reasons. For that, we secure the testing area with notice, barriers, locks, guard entry points, mm -hmm. staircase, driveways, and you know, we have the best arrangement is when we have the permission to lock down the entire substation during the test. Uh -huh. So um, the picture that you have seen earlier on is a, a, a test that we have done and we deployed eight test systems yeah. to achieve 391 kV, 300 amps of testing power. And this is to test uh, extra high voltage cables at, with a length of 23 kilometers. Yeah. The systems are fed by four units of 1MV generators. And we spend several months to prepare this test setup. And the driveway itself is a physical limitation of just 9 meters in width and 11 meters in height and without any over crane support. Our engineers use AutoCAD drawings to plot the exact position of the test system to include important considerations like avoiding structures at the second stage high output, high voltage output of the test system. Yeah, yeah. Now the sequence of deployment, direction driveway of each test system mm -hmm. and execution of erection for each of the high voltage components has to be considered very carefully. And then the next stage of the planning involves a lot of uh, electrical connections. And we change, we classify the electrical connections into the major five parts, which yeah. is the earth connection, the current carrying conductors and the return um, test current, mm -hmm. and the copper foil for the voltage control during fault, low voltage cable connections between generators, feeding unit of the system and auxiliaries, and medium voltage cable connections between excited transformers. Mm -hmm. Then the first stage 200 kV output, where we connect the system in series. And finally, the second stage 400 kV output, 
where we connect the system in parallel to, in to increase the test current of the system. Now, uh, these are the major um, important considerations and challenges we face for the on-site test in Singapore. It's so I'll hand over the floor to you. Yeah, Mr. Fu, very complex, of course. And if we can ask you one thing to put your microphone a little away from uh, your shirt here, then we have a perfect clear sound or just in front. Excellent. Thank you very much for this first insight of how complex it is to uh, do on-site uh, table, table testing in Singapore. Uh, we're going to Klaus Vatterrott. Um, in order to develop a good system of a, a good strategy, you need no, not only a system, you need a whole a strategy for good testing one must try to understand the breakdown processes. The product standards provide important information on testing after installation. Are procedures different for test lab and on-site setup? Uh, not in general, uh, it's, it's different. Um, I will focus on that, uh, that you have to understand the breakdown process. Only if you understand what happened on-site and also in the lab, um, you know uh, what you are doing there um, and uh, how to test cables. Uh, in the lab, everything is, is defined in the standards. For the on-site testing, um, that's uh, not uh, a must to uh, do that like uh, written in a standard. You have some freedoms there uh, to change uh, something. And for that, to have the right uh, uh, test parameters, you have to understand what you are doing there. If the cable is old, if it is a brand new cable, if you have a mixture of old cables and uh, new cables, how to test them. And for that, you have to understand breakdown mechanism. But I think for people who are not so familiar with that, they can um, uh, take a look to the standards. There, the results from long discussions from manufacturers, from utilities, from the research institutes, from test institutes, I gathered and there you get the hint how to test on site. And we discussed this, of course, uh, deeper during our session today. To Peter Kors, thanks for uh, the video, first of all, uh, the explanation video here. That will also go certainly around and you can share it with uh, the colleagues. The commissioning test of extruded cable systems with AC voltage near power frequency best reflects the later stress during operation. Yeah. Combined with sensitive partial discharge, it can reveal weak points in the insulation. You will, you will find them. In which way will these challenges mentioned by the colleagues and the cable design influence the test circuit? Uh, the product standards for extruded HV and EHV cables, the IIC 6840 and 62067, they require a sinusoidal test voltage in a frequency range 20 to 300 hertz. This is called near power frequency and they require the application of the voltage for 60 minutes. That means the use test equipment or the test setup must be able to fulfill these requirements. Another important thing is that the equipment should be robust enough to withstand the hard mechanical stress during the transportation on sometimes very bumpy roads. I think you agree. <laughs> And uh, a very important point is that the power consumption of such systems should be as low as possible because um, in the field we have the problem that often grid power is not available. That means a diesel generator set is the only power source and must be sufficient to feed all your test equipment and that's why it's so important. After meanwhile more than 20 years uh, experience, we see that the solution with this frequency tuned resonant test systems seems to be the best solution for this application. Um, why it is in resonant circuit? In a resonant circuit, the load capacitance means the cable forms together with the big reactor on the trailer an oscillating circuit. And such an oscillating circuit has a so-called natural frequency, which depends on the capacitance of your cable and the inductance of the reactor. And as higher the capacitance, as lower this test frequency. It means if you test a long cable with a high capacitance, then the test frequency is low. For short cables, it is high. 
if you energize such an oscillating circuit with an AC voltage exactly at this natural frequency, then you get resonance. And it means that each amount of energy you feed into the circuit remains there and oscillates between these two elements, capacitance and inductance of the H3 circuit. And the only thing what you have to do to keep the output voltage constant is to compensate the losses. They are unavoidable, uh, unavoidable. Uh, for example, coming from the uh, losses in the cable sheath, losses in the uh, copper resistance of the winding in the reactor or the iron core. But fortunately, these losses are in a range between 0.5 up to 1% of the apparent test power. Uh -huh. We have I also a second big advantage with this test equipment. Yeah. Um, due to the fixed design of the reactor, it's very easy to combine such systems together. Uh, Mr. Fu showed such a very expressive example uh, that for higher voltages, reactors can be connected in series yeah. or for long cable systems, we can connect several of these trailers in parallel. We, we hear this 400 kV story yep. of Singapore, like in a in a garage, kind of in a basement of, of a building. Um, Peter, uh, on-site testing, as we hear, is very general, of course, and I mean you are confronted with so many things in mega cities or out really in the in the field. What are the differences between SAT and diagnostic tests? The big difference is the question behind the test, which has to be answered. If we look to a so-called commissioning test, or as the IEC standards say, the test after installation, there the question is, is there somewhere in the whole cable system a weak point which can be dangerous later in operation? Yeah, independent on the nature of this uh, uh, failure. Mm -hmm. I want to find everything, everything what can be a problem later in operation before I connect the cable to the power grid. Uh -huh. That's why this test is a quality acceptance test and is in principle part of the production pro process. This is the last step in the production mm -hmm. because you check there the quality of the joint splices and cable termination which has assembled on site by humans. And you know humans sometimes make mistakes. Mm -hmm. I can imagine. Uh, also this test has an, a, con uh, an, a commercial impact. Yeah because passing this test or not passing decides if the client pays f for the cable or not. So this, this commissioning test must be comparable. And that's why the standards define very clear what kind of voltage you have to use for this, how long you have to apply the voltage, and what's the voltage level. In contrast to this, diagnostic tests should deliver completely different answers. For example, when you look back to the first generation of medium voltage cables, what's about the situation with water trees? Or what's about aging in my cable system? Mm -hmm. So um, that means you have many different questions and the tools you can use to answer these questions can be very different. Mm -hmm. So that's why this, these diagnostic tests are not defined in standards. Okay. You have some recommendation rules, but in principle you can do what you want as long as you trust your methods and the results. So it's a question of trust, a question, of course, of experience. Klaus, while all hearing this was what Peter said, and with all your experience also a long time out in the field, what and will that have an influence on the test technology to be applied? Yes, um, I think um, you have to think about what you are doing here. In the beginning, we have heard um, that uh, one of the um, uh, important uh, points is that you test near to the frequency of the of the um, later uh, of the grid uh, um, at the frequency it is used later on. Um, but um, that's that's not right in total, because um, in former times. Uh, when you have ha when we have had uh, oil filled cables or mass impregnated cables, they were always tested with DC voltage, although they are for an AC grid. And so you have to uh, use the voltage, which is the uh, and the frequency, which is the best to find the weak 
points. And for oil-filled cables and mass-impregnated cables, uh, the DC voltage was sufficient. It was the only test system which was available during that time. But now we have XLPE cables. XLPE cables have a complete other uh, breakdown behavior than uh, the uh, oil field cables. And there we have seen that with DC voltage you can't find any damages. There were done a lot of tests at, uh, uh, during the time, the uh, 1970s, when the first on-site test on medium voltage cable, XRP insulated medium voltage cables were done, where we have seen that DC voltage can damage the cable more than that you find failures. And so um, we have to uh, uh, take in, uh, into account that uh, it is uh, strongly dependent on the insulation mat material, which way of testing you use, uh, which frequency of testing you use. And so we, will, uh, we also have the debate how to test D long DC cables. Long DC cables, uh, that's a subject in, in two weeks. Long DC cables are built from with XLPE actually in Germany and there we can take into account that DC test voltage only finds the strongest failures in the cable. Maybe it's also a solution to test DC cables with AC voltage. So, but uh, there you have to take other things also into account. It's not that easy mm -hmm. to, to do uh, that in that uh, um, uh, way. Uh, you think uh, to about, uh, about the construction of the joints and of the termination, the field control systems and so on and so on. Mm -hmm. But um, it's not only to test very similar to the situation with, uh, with uh, during the, the service layer, on, you have to think about breakdown uh, uh, um, mechanism and uh, the suitable um, test frequency and uh, voltage levels. So all ongoing process, Uwe, also a comment to this subject from your side. Yeah, sure. When I was a young engineer, so there was a discussion on water trees. And uh, in that context, as an analytical me method, uh, VLF testing was developed. And uh, we still have to anticipate this difference between diagnosis as well as site acceptance tests, where we would like to focus on installation failures and uh, especially on the accessories of cables. And we are going to um, a question before we then come to our halftime um, situation. And of course, you can always like participate by our chat or, of course, by email. And I'm going giving a next uh, question to Peter Kors. IEC and I triple E standards they differentiate very much medium voltage cable and high voltage uh, cables. Why is it like this? Yeah, it's a little bit funny and hidden, the answer, because if you compare two cables, a medium, uh, extruded medium voltage cable and an extruded high voltage cable, they look very similar. Both they have a coaxial design, both they have a conductor, they have a main insulation made from XLPE, they have a cable sheath. So, of course, the diameter is a little bit different. But this is not the point. The point is not visible. This is the field stress inside the insulation. When we look to the field stress in operation in the range of medium voltage cables up to 30 kV extruded type, then we find their values uh, between 3 and 5 kV per millimeter in the XLPE. In contrast to this, in, uh, in the range of HV and EHV cables, we have field stress up to 15 kV per millimeter in a 500 kV cable on the conductor. That means uh, in a medium voltage cable, we have much more safety margin. And that's why um, it's not necessary in, in medium voltage cable due to this high safety margin to detect any small weak point because not a small weak point maybe will, not, will never cause a problem in operation, mm -hmm. but it looks completely different when we look to the high voltage uh, cables due to the higher stress of the material. We have to find any small problem mm -hmm. to avoid a very uh, uh, catastrophic failure and very costly failure in an HV or EHV cable system. Mm -hmm. And when you look to the uh, product standards for the cable, you see that this thinking re is reflected by the test parameters. When you look, for example, the test voltage for a medium voltage cable in yeah. during the routine test is 3.5 unit for five minutes. 
and in high voltage cable you have to test at 2 u naught for 60 minutes. All this difference and variates very much. Uh, given the question to, to Klaus, why is there this difference between medium voltage cables and high voltage cables? Uh, the standards for medium voltage cables are completely different than that for the high voltage cables. The medium voltage cables here have very, very clearly described the construction of the cable, the thickness of the insulation materials, the diameters of the cables, the thickness of the outer sheets, and so on and so on. And then you have some tests which have to be done. The type test, uh, uh, routine test, sample test, and site acceptance test. For the high voltage cables and the extra high voltage cables, mm -hmm. you have no description of the cables. You have only the test parameters you have to fulfill and uh, how the producer comes to a product that fulfills all the requirements, that's his uh, subject. He can design the cable like he want. Mm -hmm. So he has the whole freedom to do it. And so in the medium voltage range, he has uh, also, uh, manufacturers only for cables, and uh, others are only manufacturing accessories, and they fit together because the design is well, uh, um, well um, uh, standardized. Um, if you go to the high voltage uh, range, it is not the matter. Uh, you have to declare very clear if you want to buy a, an accessory, uh, the size of the cable you use, and it's always um, uh, you have to check if it really fits together. Mm -hmm. And this is certainly something that we can discuss here. That's why we do this format every Wednesday at 5 o'clock. We are live from Dresden with the High Vault test talk. Yeah, I would say test talk, but it's a web talk. Of course, today it's the subject is testing, on-site cable testing. And I'm going over to Uwe Kaltenborn because he collects all the questions. And as you can hear the sound, of course, we are sending here live and the production is going on in the background. Uwe, uh, we're having certainly some questions via our YouTube YouTube chat or via email? Yeah, so we have a lot of questions and the most interesting thing to me is that maybe we have uh, a lot of people in the chat which are not following what we are saying here because they're answering themselves their quest the oh, questions, nice. uh, especially also some greetings to uh, to Peter uh, as well as Klaus uh, from guys and yeah, I have tested with these guys some years ago and oh, nice. answering already questions uh, from our other colleagues. Nice. But I think we have some interesting points to discuss. So uh, one thing is, do we have to do quant quantitative or qualitative analysis or a combination of both for PD measurements on newly installed H3 cable joints? So I think uh, you have to here choose. we have a now both can answer that, I know, but I think Klaus is, uh, is now prepared for this question. Doing a lot of tests uh, with partial discharge measurements in parallel during the whole test time. I think uh, uh, actually, uh, when we perform tests, about 90 to 95 percent of the tests are um, uh, 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 voltage tests combined with partial discharge measurements. Mm -hmm. And um, yes, uh, when we test, uh, sometimes we have failures. Uh, Although we are uh, testing this partial discharge measurement, uh, especially if you have very high field strengths in the, in the accessories, uh, the, the uh, breakdown occurs within some few seconds and you can't um, uh, stop the test. Um, there are other, other tests where it needs a longer time. Uh, you can see uh, the partial discharges are growing. That's very often uh, if you test old if a combination of old cables and new cables where you test with reduced voltages. Uh, so, um, but in general, uh, to say um, something about uh, the quality, how often it uh, it uh, is that we have partial discharge and accessories. Uh, it's not, uh, you can't uh, say it generally. Um, sometimes it's happened very often a year, so we have, and sometimes uh, we do a lot of tests and we have t uh, maybe every month a breakdown. Mm -hmm. uh, in other years, there's nothing. Uh, so you can't uh, say it very uh, strict, it's, it's, but um, I think it's comparable 
comparable in the high voltage uh, like in the medium voltage range. Okay. You want to say something to this also? We ask for the next question. No, no. Yeah, sure. So we have another question there. Uh, that's more for Peter. So for AC Vistan test on a 500 kV cable, what length of cable can be tested? There was another question. What cable capacitance can be tested? So uh, I know that there will be no exact answer, but a kind of estimation uh, we might have. Yeah. With such a trailer, probably it's not possible mm -hmm. because the uh, output voltage is limited to 260 kW only. Mm -hmm. That means for the field testing of a 500 kW cable, we need a little bit more. Mm -hmm. More so trailers? Yeah, we have to combine systems. Yeah. That's why, but so from the capacitance, probably six kilometers, mm -hmm. I think. Yeah. With two setups, six kilometers, okay. Question answered, yes. Yeah, sure. Over one so more. Another question uh, where I would like to give them also the first part of the answer already. Uh, the question is, if a breakdown happens during AC uh, uh, test with the resonant test system, can we locate the cable fault using the resonant test kit. Yes, we can, and the solution is called high-res locator, but Peter can uh, add some words on that. Yeah, in principle, we record the, the death cry of the cable. It means if the cable fails, you have a fast breakdown of the voltage, and this is measured, and also the reflection on the cable ends. And then the signal is coming back, and by the measuring of the time difference, and if you know the the uh, traveling time or the traveling speed in the uh, in the cable, you can calculate backwards where was the point of the breakdown. Oh. Yeah, and finally one point, yeah. uh, which was also discussed in the chat, and uh, that was not related to cables in in the first place. It was related to IEC 62270/100. This is the uh, GIS or the switchgear uh, standard. And uh, here I would like a command, as this is one of my work also in the standardization world. Yes, and in future we will also have there not only the separate testing of the switchgear and the cable. In future, especially from the switchgear side, we will uh, change the IEC standard in such a way that we do testing both together and to we will start there definitely also on the medium voltage level. Okay, so this should it be for the first round of Great. questions from the chat. Yeah. And I think we can continue with our questions. Yeah, and, and which is wonderful that uh, we, we, we experienced this in the last uh, two calls, also in the two talks that we had already. Today is our third one, that you, of course, can answer your questions also being in the chat. And so this is kind of an expert forum there uh, with sometimes two or 300 people uh, watching us live. And this is a very nice, um, uh, yeah, what is a, what's a so-called a, um, a problem that is solved then through the questions that you give. I gave another question that we prepared in the um, in, in upfront with to Klaus. Um, what are the typical problems to establish a correct PD measurement? Uh, the biggest problem is that you can't some of them <laughs> <laughs> that you can't do a correct PD measurement on site. PD measurement in general is uh, defined only for small capacitance uh, uh, where you can make a proper calibration and so on. Um, a cable is a very long capacity and if you have a failure at the far end, you can detect it, but you never know the right value uh, of the partial discharges. That's a problem. And uh, during the time, if it is, uh, uh, we can detect it, uh, it will be reduced by traveling through the cable. And that's a problem. We don't know how it is reduced. And uh, due to the fact to localize it, we need to also to have the reflection of, of that signal. And um, if the uh, signal is very small and you have a big uh, or high ground noise level, uh, you can't detect it uh, uh, anymore, uh, the place where it happens. Uh, what we do when we do on-site tests uh, with partial discharge detection or diagnosis, um, we always try to find 
to measure as, as um, sensitive as possible. So we have to look for a frequency range where we have the lowest ground noise level, where we have the best um, values for the decoupling of partial discharges. Sometimes we have uh, uh, to change the placement. Sometimes it's not uh, the best solution to measure at the uh, termination where also the test equipment is installed. Maybe it's it, very often it's much better to detect uh, at a corresponding joint. Uh, the corresponding joint, the joints are laying in the cable, there you have no uh, coupling uh, of the ground noise level, it's only at the uh, ends of the cables and you can detect very uh, much more sensitive uh, at the, at the um, uh, corresponding joints. There you have uh, the problems that you can't synchronize it very exactly to the to the test voltage and so you all have also a loss of um, informants what what you normally need for the for the interpretation of the pattern um, but uh, with that short sentence you see if you make uh, on-site partial discharge detection measurement analysis you need experts for that um, that can only be done by very experienced engineers uh, otherwise you're lost yeah, and that's what I was thinking right now, this experience of the engineers and these antennas that they have to have going on site and being there really and have then the right solution, of course the best equipment, but then the right solutions. So the next question goes, uh, connected, or talking about PD measurements to continue this, Peter, uh, what is the correlation between test duration and evaluation of PD measurements? Yeah, that's a very interesting question. Uh, to start PD activity, uh, some uh, conditions must be fulfilled. One of them is you must have a sufficient field stress at the weak point to start the discharge. The second thing is you need some time. And this is a special problem of new installations. And this is the situation we have when we make a commissioning test of a new cable that an insulation which has been not stressed before mm, sometimes need a lot of time, several 10 mi uh, minutes before in a weak point the PD activity incepts. So, and of course, this is especially a problem for, for commissioning tests where the cable is not stressed before. And to show you that it's not only theory, I prepared from real data this diagram, the data I took from Seeker Working Group B1.28. Mm -hmm. And the diagram shows the distribution of the PD inception time for a group of cables which have been te uh, extruded cables which have been tested during a commissioning test at 1.7 U nut for one hour mm -hmm. and which show PD activity in this one hour. And this is interesting to see that after 10 minutes, only approximately the half of the cables show a PD activity. The other half did not show activity. And it means if I would stop here at this point testing yeah. after 10 minutes, the second half of the problem I cannot detect. Okay, and there it's going to be, uh, there, there we see some really interesting thing in the second part. Yeah, so, and what shows this diagram, it shows two things. One is it makes really sense to test 60 minutes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the other one shows that if you test only one minute or two minutes, then you have a very low chance to detect all weak points yeah. by PD detection. Yeah, yeah. So this is exactly also the length, maximum length of our talk here, that we have the 60 minutes. We're going to Singapore and of course we see it's very late at night already in Singapore as we saw some fantastic photos. Uh, Mr. Fu, PD measurements of course also with you a big uh, subject for diagnostics. How to interpret these patterns? Well, the Patterns are very difficult to interpret, and uh, we our challenge is that our customer will need to understand that um, sometimes the PD pattern itself is more important than absolute values. Uh, very often, people just ask about what is the passing value, the PD levels. What is it that they consider pass, or what is it they consider fail? Uh, it's very difficult, and we are telling our customers and our people that 
looking for pattern is much more important than absolute values. And now we are going to take a look at this video. We have um, taken this partial discharge on an on-site test. And you can look at it, the background noise is about 50 PC, but that doesn't deter us because these are the, these are the electronic noise. And we see that for um, this test, there was no partial discharge for 15 minutes. And after 15 minutes, the PD pattern, the PD signals come about. And this gives us a very clear indication that there is a problem yeah. with the joint or with the termination. But for this case, it's the termination and there was a, a defect and the termination was actually repaired and we redo all the tests and also the PD measurement was carried out without any PD thereafter. Mm -hmm. So this is a, a very a positive pattern that we have detected and it doesn't happen right away, 15 minutes after test, during the test into the test. Yeah, interesting. So it has to be also sometimes with patient. Uwe, to this subject, do you have some questions? Yeah, so PD that measurements? was, that was uh, definitely uh, very interesting answers and that also uh, challenged a little bit uh, our colleagues around the world. And uh, there is uh, one question coming in uh, saying uh, resonant testing uh, seems to be the only solution that can strictly satisfy current IEC standards. That's right. And there are increasingly cases, or in that case in Scotland, where it is not permissible for environmental reasons to build a suitable road to the cable test location. So what are the views of the experts on VLF, very low frequency testing, for commissioning? So. I'd like to hand it over to all three of you. So would you switch to VLF and uh, why or why not? <laughs> okay, let me start. Uh, yeah, VLF uh, has a long tradition. Uh, it was developed to make diagnostic tests on medium voltage cables long time ago, more than 20 years ago. and has a lot of uh, advantages because due, uh, due to the fact that you test on a very low frequency, the test current is very small. So that means the, te uh, the test power is also small. That means you can build very small and compact test equipment. But of course, you pay for this advantage because 0 0.0 Hz is far away from the power frequency. That means the physical effects in the insulation system, not in the cable itself. The cable itself has a coaxial design. This is not so the problem. But the problem are the accessories. If they are, for example, uh, capacitive controlled and you apply a very low frequency to such uh, equipment, then the voltage distribution in such a uh, accessory can be completely different compared to operation, but I want to know what's happened in operation. Mm -hmm. So that's why it makes it very difficult to apply very low frequency in the high voltage range. Mm -hmm. Remember I said for the medium voltage range due to the high uh, safety margin we have in the insulation, uh, we can accept it. By the way, the test voltage, also for medium voltage cable, when uh, very low frequency is applied, is much higher. Mm -hmm. It has to be 3 u nut instead of, uh, I think, 2 u nut. Uh, if we would do the same for high voltage cable, where we have, in general, a much higher field stress, then I think this is not possible. It will or can destroy the cable on one hand side and can deliver wrong results during the test. Okay. Announcement of your side, Klaus. Yes, uh, I think uh, 0.1 hertz. Um, the, the, that uh, test voltage. Uh, there were a lot of investigations in the 17th, and the results shows us that if you want to have the same uh, breakdown behavior in XLPE, you have to uh, test with a higher uh, test voltage than uh, with 50 hertz. Um, so for the for the medium voltage cable range we have the the idea that we have to test with three or not not with two or not like uh, the the resonance systems um 
but what shall we do in the in the high volt uh, in the high voltage range? Um, testing with two or not is means 128 kV uh, by 110 kV cables. Um, if you put a uh, three or not on it, you are at uh, 190 uh, kV, something like that. Uh, so um, it's a great uh, uh, jump. And um, you have to have inside the substations the clearance to the other uh, uh, um, equipment. Mm -hmm. The distance have to be have to be big enough. Um, and m the question I always uh, ask if uh, is a is a break uh, is a is a PD behavior really the same? My experience is that when we test outside, we have a lot of disturbance from outside mm -hmm. uh, if we test uh, on site. We have their fences which are not uh, directly uh, connected to ground. They make a ground noise level, they make uh, 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 give us a PD signals. Um, mm -hmm. We have other things there in the surroundings. Um, the lab, which are uh, difficult, uh, yeah. different than in the lab. In the lab, you ca uh, have everything free. You can clear everything. So you have no problems. But uh, outside, you can't do it, and um, the distances are not so so uh, uh, so big that uh, they affect uh, the the uh, measurement. And uh, last but not least, the most uh, investigation which was t uh, uh, done for, for the 0.1 hertz were only um, uh, investigations in the labs with a needle uh, in a, in a uh, XLPE installation and the growing of the, the um, um, voids of the, of the trees was investigation, in, investigated. But when we are outside, we don't want to uh, um, uh, check if there is a needle in an XLPE installation. We have the accessories and the breakdown process and mm -hmm. the accessory is a complete other than in a pure XLPE installation. And for that uh, arrangement of uh, accessories combined with cables and 0.1 hertz, there is only uh, very few investigations done. And of course, you see that we have so much to discuss that sometimes the time is uh, not enough. Of course, we can chat later on and then also during the week. And then you can send us also your questions. We are going on the final lap of this uh, talk and we're going to Mr. Fu in uh, Singapore. Uh, excuse me. Yeah, Uwe. So I would like to have also the answer uh, from Singapore because uh, oh, yeah, there we have the shortly, absolute yes. uh, pra practical side. So because uh, the question is, if you have a 400 kV cable, are you willing to use VLF as a commissioning test method? Um, in Singapore, uh, our, we, uh, we use VLF usually for medium voltage cable and for the cables at the high voltage and the extra high voltage um, is usually and is required uh, also by uh, our customers that we perform high voltage uh, AC tests for one hour with PD measurement, and we need to conduct and measure PD with PRPD patterns. That means you really have to synchronize your PD equipment and measure PD with actual capturing of all the data. And we do also uh, joint hopping, and we measure PD at every joint or every um, what you call that the link, the link box. And this is how it's done in Singapore. And our it seems like the, the people here may understand that the VLF is more for the medium voltage and they see that uh, there's water tree that you can, you can find in the XLP and in medium voltage, even if you have a large uh, PD and we have tested medium voltage with uh, nano coulombs of discharge, you know, although we cannot quantify, but the values are, are large, but the cable doesn't fail. So that means in the XLP, there, is, there could be water tree, and yet the cable has not failed. But in transmission or at high voltage cables, I think there is very little chance that there is a problem with water tree and the cable hasn't failed. You know? So this is, this is my uh, opinion of it. Yeah. Great, and we stay with you, Mr. Fu, for uh, the last round also, because one thing is the VLF, uh, what we talked about right now, but what do you see uh, when you go to AC cables and, of course, the increasing length, they're getting longer and longer. What does that mean to the test setup? 
Well, definitely this is going to be a challenge, especially in Singapore, everything is compact and we have uh, right now uh, development and into underground substation. So when it comes to underground substation, everything will be tight and whatever space that we used to have, even in a multi-story level uh, substation, we may not be having the same kind of space. I think uh, the, in, in Singapore, I think we are uh, fortunate and not so fortunate because we are fortunate that we are small because the, the cable length, I think we are projecting in the future, maybe we will get up to 40 kilometers. And at 40 kilometers, we have made some preliminary calculation. We could still do uh, the test with whatever we have and also the setup is still possible. Mm -hmm. And we will always look for a high road for a solution if we have a challenge in this way. Very challenging, horizontal, vertical and up and down. Of course, we're going to the last round here uh, with Peter. Um, what has that to be taken in consideration if talking about offshore cables and then especially the wet design? Yeah, this is really a challenge. Um, if we look to land cables, they have a single core design. It means you have the conductor, you have the main insulation and you have a cable sheath, which is strong enough to overtake the complete capacitive current of the cable. When we look to uh, submarine cables, uh, we find very often a so-called three core design. It means we have the three phases each one cable uh, with the conductor, with the main insulation yeah, and covered by a thin lead sheet. So one millimeter, two millimeter only. And around these three phases, we have the so-called armoring. This is the mechanical protection of the cable. And if you lay the cable into the water, then uh, the seawater travels inside the armoring and touch the surface of the three phases and by this it forms a very nice bypass for the sheath current and improves also the cooling of the cable. Um, there is an additional nice effect in operation due to the three phases. We have a phase shift of 120 degree between the phases and this leads to a kind of compensation of the lead of the current in the cable sheets. So finally in operation such a submarine cable has only a very small current in this lead sheet. Uh, the problem comes if we have to test such a cable in the factory before in the last step it is wounded to the or moved to the turntable on the laying vessel. Uh, there may be our laying 50 kilometer cable on a big uh, turntable in the factory and we have to test this cable. The problem is we have no water, no water yes. so that means we have to fight against a very high uh, screen resistance due to the missing water. We have no compensation by the other two phases because we test with a single phase voltage. And of course, the cooling is very poor, especially for the inner windings on the, of the turntable. And so there is a very high risk that the cable can be destroyed during testing by melting of the lead sheet. Oh my God, yes. So and the question is, what can be done against this? And I was, it was a little bit showed on the slides. Um, one possibility in the f in the factory is you have access to both cable ends, mm -hmm. and if you feed the cable. On from both sides, then you change the current distribution in the uh, cable and this can reduce in the best way the losses compared to a single side feeding down to a quarter. Okay. And the other thing is uh, the losses in the cable screen depend on the current. Mm -hmm. Of course, the capacitance is given, also the test voltage, but if I can test at a lower frequency, this reduces the current. Yeah. And because the losses of a resistor depend on the square of the current, when I go from 20 hertz, for example, to 10 hertz test frequency for the same cable, then I can reduce also the losses by a quarter. Okay. And this is the reason why the uh, uh, Secre brochure 490 recommends to extend the frequency range for the testing of long submarine cables from ah. 20 to 300 hertz for the land cables down to 10 hertz up to 500 hertz. 
you could see this that is very helpful and yeah. you see submarine cable testing is a big challenge also for the future absolutely and it's going to be more and more of course the wind parks are going far yeah. out more to the shore from the shorelines away that you yeah. could don't see it from there so the offshore and uh, the wet design cables we could do an own uh, web talk actually last question uh, short answer from uh, klaus what are the dependencies of test voltage level test voltage frequency and again the test duration yes i think uh, it's it's uh, like everything for the uh, on-site testing not easy to answer but um, from my side uh, i have tested once a cable um, uh, with a reduced uh, voltage due to the fact that it was a mixture of an old cable and a new installation. It has, has had a reduced voltage level and, and, and a reduced testing time. During that test we have seen partial discharges and no breakdown occurs during the testing time. That shows me that if you only make partial discharge, uh, only a high voltage test, you have to keep uh, the the voltage levels and the test voltage levels and the time like it is in the standard. If you reduce something, I strongly rec recommend to uh, make partial discharge measurement beside because then uh, the, uh, you have the risk that uh, a failure is not brought to a breakdown during the test time and the breakdown will occur during the uh, service later on. So what we learned, of course, that we could like continue and continue and continue, Uwe, I think, but at this time we have the 60 minutes full uh, for this web talk, which is always very, very nice, thanks to your participation. And uh, just to, to, to sum it up for, uh, for a second, um, the, the on-site testing uh, and the on-site for on-site acceptance of installed cables, of course, is the key to find issues in cables and their accessories after installation. And here the resonant testing systems are key to test cables close to their efficient operation conditions to find failures during testing. That's what we talked about today. The testing conditions, they vary, as we heard, of course, in a very wide range from Singapore, very dense to the water, to offshore. We all had, uh, to the, we discussed all this today. And um, to execute these tests and to analyze the test uh, results also um, gets more and more here into, into detail. An outlook to next week, what we're going to talk next week, Uwe, we are looking forward to have some more experts today. I, before I tell what we have next week, I say thank you very much to Peter, to Klaus, to Mr. Fu in Singapore. And as always, we have a little chocolate Dresdner Frauenkirche for you. Mr. Fu, you again have always, it's our partner um, that is, yeah, which is uh, per video. You have to print it out with your 3D printer. You put chocolate in your 3D <laughs> printer and you, you print it out, okay? Okay, but I will come to Germany and look for you. Then you for the chocolate. Yes, yes, you, you, you look for the chocolate here. Uh, we have it behind the scenes, our two other uh, guests here, and um, they get it. Thank you very much. And Uwe, next week, um, we are also here at High Vault, of course, and um, we discuss the way uh, factory and, and production testing and on-site testing can be combined. So we have the best from all next week. Uh, yes, we will have definitely the best of all, but I think the question is much more in which way we can guarantee the quality of equipment manufactured, installed and to be brought into operation so uh, that we have the most efficient way to go through this process. And that's what we would like to discuss next week. Next week at 5 p.m. live here from Dresden, of course, with your participation. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much again at this time. Live here we are saying goodbye and good night to all over the world from Dresden. <laughs>